Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Please be seated. I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the uh, book of Acts, chapter 20. I mean, in the old days, we used to say when we're going to refer to another passage, just put your finger in that passage and then uh, turn your Bible to uh, uh, John chapter 21. I know you can't always do that with uh, your electronic copy, but hopefully you have uh, just that reference to know that we're going to begin with John chapter 21, and then we're going to move into our passage of Acts chapter 20. In this uh, age of self, the language is full of phrases that glorify personal choice over other values. For instance, a phrase like self-determination, self-knowledge, self-esteem, self-help, and even do-it-yourself. In this type of climate, doctrine is not safe, and leadership is not accepted without scrutiny. The touchstone of belief today is the individual and not the institution. Those in authority have little or limited authority. And there is a disrespect for leadership, whether it be in politics, the workplace, the schoolhouse, or even the home. Now the church is not immune to this type of thinking. Baptists are referred to as the people of the book, meaning the Bible. But for many, they follow their own conscience rather than biblical authority. There's an appropriate analogy that comes from the fast food industry. There's a restaurant that serves burgers and says, have it your own way. So in this type of climate, how do you lead? How do you lead when followers don't want to be led? Jesus taught us this in John chapter 21. If you will, look at verse 15. After his resurrection, he had breakfast with his disciples. And after they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Oh, yes, Lord, he said to him. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. He told him a second time, he asked Simon, he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. So he asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Well, Peter uh, was grieved that he had asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my sheep. This morning's passage, we're going to look at the life of a leader named Paul as we've been going through his third missionary journey. And we're going to find an example of what it means to be a loving leader. And apply it to our own lives, whether it be in the church house, the schoolhouse, the home, or in politics. How do we lead from love? Acts 20, beginning with verse 1. After the uproar, remember Paul has on his third missionary journey, he's in Ephesus, and there was a great commotion as a result of the proclamation of Jesus Christ as being Lord, God, and Savior. Paul sent for the disciples, he encouraged them, and after saying farewell, departed to go to Macedonia. And when he had passed through those areas and offered them many words of encouragement, he came to Greece and stayed there three months. The Jews plotted against him when he was about to set sail for Syria, so he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Pyrrhus from Berea, Aristarchus, and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derbe, Timothy, Antichicus, and Trophimus from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us in Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the festival of unleavened bread. In five days we reached them at Troas, where we spent seven days. On the first day of the week we assembled to break bread. Paul spoke to them. And since he was about to depart the next day, he kept on talking till midnight. 
So this morning, I hope that I will bring to you these three principles about leading in love. First of all, teaching. To teach God's Word. And I want to share with you also about being transparent. And the last thing I want to share with you is how to set an example through uh, tenacity. So teaching, transparency, and tenacity. And what that looks like when we're leading people in a loving way. I don't know which one of us is not able to look around our world today and to see all of the the struggles people are going through and the geopolitical climate. It's a mess. We live in a mess. But there's something that makes sense out of all of this, and it's Jesus. Because of Jesus, my eyes are fixed on a hope, on an eternity, on a purpose, and a reason for living. And today, in a day when oil, it's one I can before the Lord and ask Him to draw us nearer to Him. So, I desire that this morning you would draw us to your side. Your word says that if we, a man would cleanse himself of these things. That we wouldn't be double-minded. But our focus and our fix and our gaze would be on You. That we would draw near to You and You would draw near to us. So in this moment, Lord, we would come before You confessing our sin. Acknowledging the fact that we fall woefully short of your holiness, so often depending on our flesh and our own nature, rather than the Spirit. So, would you hear our confession right now? And empower us to turn from our ways and to trust you. Regardless of what's going on in our world today, and even closer to home, and even maybe right in our home, that we would fix our eyes on you and trust you that you have a, a purpose, a plan, and that you're going to work all things for good for those who love you and are called according to that purpose. So thank you, Father, for this opportunity to come into your presence and be drawn to your side. I ask that you would speak to us, teach us this morning from your word. Use me for your purpose in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Number one in your your I encourage you to take the bulletin that you received and in your in that bulletin there's an outline of today's message. I want to encourage you because first of all there is a need for leadership wherever it may be. And God wants us to be good leaders. And one thing that is needed to be a good leader and that is teaching that is healthful. Teaching that brings health. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 reminds us that there's nourishment by the words of, a, of the faith and the good teaching about God and His kingdom. There's nourishment coming from God's Word. Now I'll tell you, sometimes there's junk food there too. I hope if you've listened uh, recently about the prediction that yesterday the world was going to come to an end. Folks, that's a bunch of junk food that's going on around that you just need to avoid and remain faithful to the solid teachings of God's Word. Let me give you the solid teaching of God's Word concerning the future. 
and even an end. The Lord said that no one knows the time or the day. So if someone claims that September 23rd, the world's going to end, you have to immediately say what? Junk food. We have got to nourish on the sound teaching of God's word. So number one, under teaching that is healthful. Be encouraging. Be encouraging through the scriptures. Verses one through three, after the uproar was over, Paul sent for the disciples, and it says that he encouraged them. Now, when you think of encouragement, I don't, I don't think of what Paul is saying here is that, hey, everything's gonna be better. Hey, things are gonna look brighter. Hey, you're a good looking person, or man, you're really bright, and I think there's a future for you. That's not what he's saying about encouragement here. After saying farewell, he departed to go to Macedonia. And when he had passed through those areas, he offered them many words of encouragement. And the words of encouragement that Paul would express would bring true encouragement would be the teachings from God's Word. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, Paul told Timothy this, Until I come, give attention to what? Flowering your conversation? Spewing accolades toward people? No, he said not at all. He said to the public reading, exhortation and teaching. Right in between the public reading of Scripture and the teaching is this encouraging, exhorting, building up. You are going to lead by building others up with that sound teaching of God's Word. That's why Jesus said to, to Peter, he said, Peter, do you love me? And of those three occasions, occasions, he said this in the responses. He said, number one, feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. We are going to be an encouraging leader if we teach the sound truths of God's word. Those under our care with the teachings of God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know from your infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. And then Paul said it this way concerning the wonderful gift of salvation, what Jesus Christ came to do to provide for you and me, to give us the forgiveness of sin. He said this, for I pass on to you not some wishful thinking, some hopeful expectation. He said, I pass on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. If we are going to give good leadership, regardless of what other people may think about us, if we are called to lead, then we must teach from God's word. Because number two, it's equipping the saints. Because my desire is not that you know what I know. My desire is that you learn from what God wants to teach you. I want to equip people so that they can take God's Word and have God teach them from His Word. If I tell you something, that's one thing. But if God tells you something, oh my, that changes everything. You give a man a fish, he'll be fed for a day. But you teach him to fish, He can be fed for the rest of his life. And so I give you fish today, but also to teach you how to fish for yourself. That's what leaders do. Learn for themselves from God. So we are, as leaders, if you're a leader, you are to be equipping the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing in maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness, then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning and cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every 
who is the head, Christ. From him the whole body, fitted and knitted together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. The teaching is that recognizing that we are not just individuals, but collectively we are an entity. We are the body of Christ. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. So let every word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom and teaching, admonishing one another through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Do you see the, the communal language here? He's saying to them, among you, one another, your hearts, not just the heart, but your hearts. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus thanks to God the Father through him. In Titus chapter 1, verse 9, holding to the faith the message is taught so that he will be able to both encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. The third thing, by setting the example. Not only encouraging through Scripture and equipping the saints, but also setting the example. Now, it's one thing to tell somebody how they should understand God's scripture. And then it's another thing to show them how to do it. When you show them how to do it, you solidify your teaching. But you also validate your teaching. You can't teach one thing and live something contrary. There has to be a consistency. So it's not only important to teach, but it's also important to set the example. The example will solidify that in a person's heart in their lives first peter chapter 4 verse 12 he says don't let anyone despise your youth young timothy even though you're to read the scripture and to encourage and to teach don't let them despise your youth but set an example for the believers in speech and faith and in purity first peter chapter 5 verse 3 as peter was exhorting the elders he said to them you're not the lord and over those entrusted you but being examples to the flock in second timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 5 i solemnly charge you before god in christ jesus who is going to judge the living and the dead and because of his appearing and his kingdom preach the word be ready in season and out of season rebuke correct and encourage with great patience and teachings for a time will come it will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine but according to their own desires, will be teachers for themselves because they have an itching ear to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. But as for you, exercise self-control in everything. Endure hardship. Work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And as we teach, be diligent. Present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be correctly teaching the word of truth. There is a day, and it could be today, and I believe it's possibly here, that people want to hear what they want to hear, rather than the solid, te solid teaching of God's word. But as leaders, we have the responsibility, whether or not people want to listen, to preach and teach the word of God. To set the example, to encourage and exhort through the Word of God, and to remain faithful in that task. And know that God is going to use that to lead His people. Because our people need to be fed. Let me encourage you, parents when you rise up and when you lie down, teach your children the Word of God. Sunday school teachers, discipleship training teachers, likewise, teach. Your people, the Word of God. And set the example for them. And you in the workplace, in the schoolhouse, live that example. When the door is open, proclaim to them the good news of Jesus Christ. And watch how God uses you to be a leader in every facet of life by nourishing those around you with that healthy teaching of the Word of God. Number two. Transparency. I want you to see transparency in a leader. Transparency, and I, I refer to this as being helpful. Some transparency is not helpful. 
But there is transparency, which is helpful. One of the things I see about leaders, they sometimes act like they have it all together. I will remind you this morning, I do not have it all together. Matter of fact, I don't even know where it is most of the time. Even to pull it all together. But I know who holds it all together for me. And one thing you and I need to be as leaders is transparent. In verse 3, the Jews plotted against him when he's about to set sail for Syria. So he decided to go back through Macedonia. They were out to get Paul. They were out to destroy him. He knew that even God said that he was going to protect him. There were times where that protection was not going to be there for him. In a certain case, he did say he was going to protect him. But at this point, he didn't know for sure in this particular instance that God was going to protect him. He may just allow persecution to come to him. Those around him looked at it and said, you know what, Paul? You're going to be in big trouble if you don't, you don't leave. Paul's going to stand up and let them have it, but they rescued Paul. Folks, leaders, it is necessary for those around us to see that we are vulnerable. We're capable of making mistakes. We're capable of not having all the answers. We're capable of falling apart. In 2 Paul shares that about his own life. He said, in fact, I have made up my mind about this. I would not come to you on another painful visit for it caused you pain. He basically tells them in this passage that he understands that coming to them was going to be hurtful and painful. And the last thing he wanted to do was to cause them any more pain. But he did know that they needed some clear teaching. He was extremely troubled and anguished in his heart. I not want to cause you pain at all, but you should know the abundant love I have for you. In verses 12 and 13, he said, When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though the Lord opened a door for me, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find my brother Titus. Instead, I said goodbye to them and left for Macedonia. You can see this guy had emotional anguish. He struggled over those that he was to lead because they didn't always respond as the way they should respond. And his heart was broken. In chapter 7, verses 6 through 7. But God, who comforts the downcast, comfort us by the arrival of Titus. When he was broken up over the fact whether or not he would see it, or whether or not they were going to continue to respond to the message that he was proclaiming about Jesus Christ and the kingdom. He says, not only by his arrival, but also the comfort that he received from you. He told us about your deep longing, your sorrow, and your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. This church, like every other church, was to be a reflection of his ministry. And they, he thought for sure they had rejected him. And then Titus brings this good news to him that they were following the faith. They had a hiccup in their walk, but they were back on track, and certainly this brought him joy. But no doubt he anguished over the fact that they may be turning away from the message that he was proclaiming. I will tell you this about a leader, whether it be in the home or anywhere else that you are a leader. People will always admire your strengths, but they'll identify with your weaknesses. People will always admire your strengths, but they will identify with your weaknesses. Divulging details about your life for the sake of others is okay, but not for the purpose of grandizing your own life or exalting yourself, but always what's best for them. People want to know that you get sick, but they don't want you to throw up on them. You got it? Let them know you're sick. But you don't have to tell them everything. Paul was vulnerable. And if you're going to be a good leader, you're going to teach that which is healthful. And you're going to be transparent to the place where it's helpful.
in Acts chapter 20. Verses 4 through 5. The second thing is that not only was he vulnerable, but his companions were valuable. When it tells us that he accompanied uh, Sopater and the rest of them, you can see that Paul was in communion with other brothers here. He had a, a very unique relationship with them because of their purpose and their mission as God's people. One thing you and I have got to understand is that we need each other. See, I, I can't be a leader on a walk and going in a direction unless there are those behind me following. If they're not following, then I'm just on a walk. You see, this thing we call church, there is an understanding that we need each other. Someone might be the, the shoulder, the other is the arm, and then the other is the hand. Let me tell you, the hand is going to be useful if the arm is not there and the shoulder is not there. There is a direct need for each other. And then the Hebrew writer tells us in chapter 10, let's, let's watch out for one another to provoke love and good works. Not neglecting the gathering together, some in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 5. Now as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, the same way we who are many are one body in Christ and individual members of one another. The eye cannot, in verse, 20, in verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. We need one another. Transparency. Transparency teaches this, that I am vulnerable. And transparency is that you are valuable. We need each other. Is it fair enough? Let's move on to the next thing then. And transparency leads us to the third thing. Tenacity. Tenacity that's faithful. First of all, our tenacity needs to be faithful in ministry. In verses 6 and 7, he says, But we sailed away from Philippi after the feast of unleavened bread. In five days we reached them at Troas, where we spent seven days. And then the first day of the week we assembled to break bread. That's when he finally reaches Troas. And Paul spoke to them, and since he was about to depart the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. Now I just that last verse in verse 7, and I think of what Paul must have been going through knowing that the next day he's going to depart. I'm assuming he had packing to do. I'm assuming he had loose ends to tie up. And I imagine he was going to get up in the early in the morning and to leave and uh, probably needed his rest. But what is Paul's attitude here? He spends all night teaching those people when he could have been home packing. When he could have been home resting for the big adventure tomorrow. But he taught right to the end of the day. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, since we have this ministry, because we are shown mercy, we do not give up. I want to tell you something about Paul here. He is celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread. These are seven days before the Passover. Paul's in Macedonia. His desire is to leave Macedonia and to go all the way to Syria so he could celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem like every good Jew could. But because there was persecution against him, he went back through Macedonia and all the way over to Troas. And in that time, rather than experiencing what he hoped to experience, to be in Syria, to be in Jerusalem, to celebrate the Passover, he's preaching and teaching. He's looking at more opportunities to fulfill his ministry. He wasn't going to give up. 
He looked at it as a door of opportunity. Yeah, some of our plans aren't going to work out like we'd hope. But we keep doing what God's called us to do. And Paul maintained that ministry. I don't give up. He said, instead, we have renounced things. Not acting deceitfully or distorting the Word of God, but commending ourselves before God into everyone's conscience by an open display of the truth. But if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we are not proclaiming ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, had shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. In chapter 4, verse 13 through 16, And since we have the same spirit of faith in keeping with what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. For we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us and present us with you. Indeed, everything is for your benefit. You hear that? Everything is for your benefit. So that, as the grace extends through more and more people, it may cause thanksgiving to increase to the glory of God. Therefore, therefore, why? Why are we doing this? He just got finished saying it so God will get the thing we do. Therefore, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, the inner person is being renewed day by day. Do you hear the tenacity? There are going to be people who want their ears itched. There's going to be people who want to hear what they want to hear. There's going to be people who don't want to hear the truth of God's Word. But you and I, we keep feeding them, keep feeding them, teaching them the Word of God. We keep opening our lives up, being transparent, letting people see what God is doing and transforming us. And we keep going with the tenacity that does not give up. He desired to be in Jerusalem for Passover. What part of leading is easy? Nothing. Did Jesus say, pick up your teddy bear and follow me? Did Jesus say, pick up your blankie and follow me? Or pick up your passy and follow me? He said, pick up your cross and follow me. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Ladies and gentlemen, Brothers and sisters in Christ, you have been called to be a leader. Wherever God has placed you, and that task is not easy. And Jesus never meant it to be easy, but it is rewarding. Because you have an opportunity to give God glory. by not giving up. Not only in his ministry, but also his mission. Let me remind you what Paul is doing in this whole scenario. On his third missionary journey, he made his way to Ephesus. There he encouraged the saints. But he was also in process of taking up an offering, going through Asia, Macedonia, going all the way back and delivering it to Jerusalem to relieve those who were struggling as a result of great poverty. And so he had a ministry. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, it says, Now about the collection for the saints, do the same as I instructed in Galatian, in the Galatian churches. Then the first day of the week, each of you is to set something aside and save it in keeping with how he is prospering so that no collections will need to be made when I come. When I arrive... I will send with you letters of those who recommend to carry the gift to Jerusalem. If it is suitable for me to go as well, they will travel with me. So with them in this passage. They are part of churches that are joining him with this offering to take it back to Jerusalem. His mission, he's on a mission to make sure this offering gets there. Romans chapter 15, he says it again in verses 25 to 28. 
When he, sp- when he wrote the book of Romans, he was in Corinth. So he's at the southern part of, uh, uh, of Asia, and he's saying to them, he's saying, right now I am traveling to Jerusalem to serve the saints, because Macedonia, Achaia, were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased, and indeed are indebted to them. For the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual benefit, then they are obligated to minister them in material needs. So when I have finished this and safely delivered the funds to them, I will visit you on the way to Spain. In Paul's mission, he was demonstrating his love for the entire church. Bringing both the Gentiles and the Jews together so that animosity that was there would be dispelled. Those Gentiles would be taking up an offering to take back that were in Jerusalem, the Jewish Christians, so that the church would know of love, the love of God and his love for the saints and their love for one another. And he was also working on unity. Folks, if there's a mission that we need to be on, those two things should encompass that mission, loving one another, loving the entire church, and doing what we can to maintain the unity as God's people. When Paul finally reached Jerusalem with the collection, the Jews were incensed at his presence and tried to kill him. The Romans rescued him. In two years, he was imprisoned. And then he was on a long, difficult voyage to Rome to be on trial before the emperor. The sacrifice Paul was willing to endure revealed his great love for the church, his tenacity to stay on his mission as well as his ministry. That is how you lead, regardless of how those you lead perceive you or how they follow. You lead out of your love for the Lord and the calling of your life. Jesus said, if you love me, well, Lord, you know I love you, then feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Shepherd my sheep. Do you love him? He says, let me see it. Let me see it. Father, Thank you. Thank you for these clear teachings on what it means to love you. Not because we're in it for ourselves, but we live on behalf of others. Those you have placed under our care, we have the tremendous privilege of sharing the gospel with those who don't know you, and to encourage through your word those who do so that they may grow as mature men and women so that they will not be tossed around by the winds or the seas of deceitful false doctrine but they will be built up in the body of Christ Father, help us to be those leaders. As you place us in the home, in the church, in the political world, in our communities, the schoolhouse, the workplace, wherever you have us, Lord, may we be useful to you as a leader, pointing people to Jesus Christ. Father, we commit ourselves to you and to that task. We give this invitation to you as we surrender our lives to you. Lord, use this invitation for your purpose in Jesus' name. Amen.